Um, so today I'm just going to talk uh, a bit about some of the um, numerical micromagnetic modeling work that we've been doing on type and magnetites. Uh, and we'll start with some a, a very basic um, a bit of background on titanomagnetites, their prevalence uh, properties, and a little bit of the and the L theory implications. And I think many of you will be familiar with these, but I think it's worthwhile um, recapping this and, and reiterating it because there's some interesting things to be uh, to be seen and to be gotten there. Um, and we'll look at um, micromagnetic modeling um, of some of the critical thresholds, so the boundaries that are important for paleomagnetic and rock magnetic work, looking at the superpower magnetic uh, single domain and the single uh, vortex thresholds. And we've also been looking at uh, modeling the um, magnetic moments, the magnetizations uh, that are carried by the Titan magnetite series, and really looking at how the, they compare and how it changes with size, shape and uh, composition. And lastly, I'll, I'll talk on a little bit about some of the latest results that we've got, um, looking at some of the hysteresis parameters in the modeling um, of hysteresis and backfield data for uh, TM compositions. So I think most of you should are, be fairly familiar with uh, type of magnetites. It forms uh, a solid solution series between the um, iron rich end member magnetite and the titanium rich member uh, oval spinel. And with this uh, change in composition, there is a, a systematic change in uh, Curie temperature. So top magnetite has the normal Curie temperature of 580 degrees Celsius, whereas ilmenite has its Curie temperature uh, well below room temperature at minus 153. So what we've done here in, in part of this study has really been about trying to compile uh, some of the largest data sets uh, possible, data sets possible, and that characterize the magnetic properties of uh, type of magnetites. And this is just showing um, a fairly common um, graph that appears in most textbooks, um, where we've put together all of the Curie temperature data. And we can uh, fit this systematic change uh, with Curie temperature um, by a fairly well-fitting uh, polynomial. And one of the reasons that we want to do that is to try and get an estimate of how uh, prevalent titanomagnetites are in, in geological and archaeological material. Because if you look through the literature, and I pretty much guarantee that almost everybody here today has encountered a, a rock or an archaeological artifact, igneous, metamorphic or sedimentary material, which has uh, most likely some form of um, titanomagnetite. So we've compiled together um, around a thousand um, Curie temperatures from, from igneous rocks. Um, we see a range of, of Curie temperatures that are about 60 to uh, nominally 585 um, degrees Celsius. And so we can use this relationship with the Curie temperature to get a rough estimate um, of how common type of magnetites are. So if we turn these um, Curie temperatures into an inferred uh, TM composition, what we find is that uh, about 25% um, of all of the uh, minerals that are recorded in these thousand igneous specimens are magnetite, or they're very, very low uh, type of magnetite, so TM0 to TM5. And so what that kind of implies actually, and conversely, is that 75%, um, so three quarters, the vast majority of the magnetic minerals that we look at when we're looking at igneous rocks, um, are inferable to be some intermediate to high titanium um, titanomagnetite. Now, there may be some oxidation or some exotic minerals that contribute up to that 75%. But a key point is that uh, the vast majority of minerals that we have in, in, in our igneous specimens are not magnetite. But our understanding of uh, rock magnetic properties of our paleomagnetic records hinge uh, very heavily on our understanding of how magnetite uh, records a uh, magnetic field, how it uh, influences uh, rock magnetic properties like uh, remnants ratios, coercivities, and so on. And so the point here really is that we have a, a large amount of material where we don't necessarily have a full and systematic understanding of how it influences the records uh, that we're interested in, in studying. And so this study is really about making that first step with micromagnetism uh, and understanding the, the full range of properties from the titanomagnetite series, not only those from uh, N-member magnetite. And so to do this, we've been using uh, the micromagnetic model uh, Merrill, which was written by uh, Conway and essentially from Wynne Williams in the Edinburgh group. 
And this allows us to, I won't go into the details of how this, uh, this system works. Um, if you're interested, I would recommend reading uh, Paddy O'Conway's paper. And what we can do with this though, is we need to have um, a large set of, of fundamental intrinsic magnetic properties that characterize the materials that we are uh, looking to model. And in particular, what we need to have is, is estimates of uh, saturation magnetization, MS, the exchange uh, constant, um, and the two um, cubic anisotropy constants, K1 and K2. So as I said, we've been compiling um, a large number of data across um, almost 50 or 60 years worth of, of literature, um, compiling together hundreds of, of different data points from uh, dozens of different papers. And what we've been able to do is to compile quite a, a, an in-depth, um, a comprehensive data set of how uh, saturation magnetization varies with um, uh, titanium composition. And we see this again, this classic um, consistent trend of decreasing um, saturation with um, increasing titanium composition. And again, this is something that we find um, quite regularly throughout uh, many of the textbooks. When we're looking to try and characterize um, the exchange constant, however, there, however, there is quite a, a paucity of data. Uh, the exchange constant has been characterized for magnetite, but there is um, essentially no data um, for titanomagnetite. And so to characterize the exchange, what we've had to do is to use uh, a Curie temperature scaling law that was proposed by uh, Chikazuma, uh, Chikazumi sorry, in 64. And essentially, this is essentially basically scaling um, the magnetite um, exchange constant, which was determined by uh, Heider and Williams, and the, the scaling this by the Curie temperature of uh, the titanium magnetites. And so we have this big uh, gap here uh, across the entire TM range where we don't have data to constrain this relationship. But what we've been doing um, is a combination of some low temperature experiments, um, which Bruce Moskowitz has been doing at the, uh, the IRM. And we've been working on some uh, ab initio and DFT calculations to try and uh, constrain whether or not this relationship is valid. Unfortunately, this is quite a time consuming process. And so we haven't actually been able to um, show any results yet, but it, it is looking quite promising. And the last two constants that we're uh, interested in constraining are the anisotropy constants, K1 and K2. There's quite a large amount of data uh, available for uh, K2 and we can map out um, a systematic trend, it's a, not, not decreasing or increasing, but it um, uh, decreases in magnitude a little bit and then comes back up to zero as we get to higher titanium compositions. And similarly, K2 um, shows that essentially a polynomial fit at variable um, anisotropy with um, titanium composition. But there's a couple of interesting things to, to just kind of get out of um, these, these properties. We can see that essentially, um, from um, TM not magnetite up to sort of about TM50 or so, um, the K1 anisotropy constant dominates. And this, this suggests that we have essentially um, a cubic anisotropy with easy axes oriented along the 1, 1, 1 axis. As we get to higher composition, this flips um, and K2 becomes uh, dominant. So we move to 1, not, not easy axes. And so we can actually plot this out um, to look at how the orientation of magnetic easy axes varies to the magneto crystalline anisotropy axes, how they vary with composition. And we can see that the easy axis shown in blue goes from the traditional 111 for magnetite um, at high TM50 to um, about TM59. It goes to uh, a 110 axis. And then for TM60, it goes to uh, a 100. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that there are these uh, transitions in the easy axis. And so there are finite compositions where essentially there is no single easy axis, but we have what's called an easy plane. So where we have this transition here, we have an easy plane in the 111 and the 110 axis. And when we have a transition here, we have an easy plane in the 110, uh, 100 axis. And essentially what that means or what it could mean, and we won't get into details here, but it's something that, that I think is really interesting and, and should be thought about in more detail, is that as we go through the sort of oxy solution process, if this happens at low temperature, these transitions in composition, the transitions in the easy axis essentially represent um, an opportunity for partial uh, randomization 
um, of our magnetization. So if we have a sample um, at some composition of TM55, and it were to uh, undergo some um, low temperature oxyx solution, this remnants that it might be carrying may be partially randomized and partially lost uh, as it transitions um, to a lower uh, titanium composition. And so that's kind of an interesting thing that sort of comes out of, of, of digging into the kind of properties and the variation of uh, the properties of, of, of titanium magnetites. But it's not the main focus of, of what I'm going to talk about today. What we're really interested in, in talking about today is, is the domain states, the, the um, boundaries on the critical grain sizes. And so what we've been looking at is firstly looking at the superpower magnetic threshold. So the threshold where we go from uh, a particle which is has its magnetization uh, easily randomized by thermal fluctuations to a stable single domain state where uh, the magnetization is stable for uh, geologically significant periods of time. Now this can actually be done uh, very simply through uh, Niel theory and Niel calculations. But what we've done here is we've used Merrill, we've used the micromagnetic models uh, to determine this because there's some interesting features that get lost if we just rely um, on, on Niel theory. <clears throat> and so the method that we use um, to do this is uh, what's called the NEB method. And this is the nudged uh, elastic band method. And the, the grains that we're looking at are equidimensional grains. But we look at a, a series of uh, morphologies from simple spheres to cubes, uh, cube octahedrons, and uh, octahedrons. And so this is showing um, the, the grain size threshold in uh, ESD. So this is equivalent spherical diameter. So we're taking uh, the grain volume and we're calculating the sphere that has the equivalent um, volume and then calculating the, the diameter of that sphere. And all of the grain sizes that we talk about today will be in this uh, ESD. And so what we can see is that um, for, for magnetite, for TM0, the effect of, of morphology, the change in the grain shape, doesn't really matter too much. Uh, and we get our, um, our SP threshold on the order of about 50 to uh, 56 nanometers. As we um, increase the titanium composition, we get a, a, a lowest, the lowest threshold around TM15 to TM25. And these are on the order of about 45 to 50 nanometers. So a fraction smaller than, than magnetite. But as we get to higher TM compositions, uh, and in particular above about TM50 or so, what we see is that the SP threshold starts to increase uh, quite significantly. And we start to get a, a divergence between uh, the different geometries. So if we look at TM60, uh, for example, uh, a sphere will give us a, um, uh, a, an SP threshold of about 175 um, nanometers, but a cube um, and an octahedron will give us something about 125. So we've got a 50 nanometer difference here. And this difference in geometry um, is, is quite important because it tell, essentially it tells us that configurational anisotropy, so the, the geometry itself and how the poles, the magnetic poles are arranged around the surface of this geometry, they play a very important factor in determining the magnetic properties. And this is particularly so for uh, TM60 because the two uh, magneto, magneto crystalline anisotropy constants are quite low. So magneto crystalline anisotropy is very weak and this is, uh, then allows the, the configurational anisotropy, the geometry, to have a larger impact on the uh, magnetic properties. We've also looked at the um, thresholds between single domain and single vortex. And the way that we do this is by starting with a, a uniformly, a small uniformly magnetized grain. We increase uh, the grain size, um, starting from a uniform magnetization until we collapse into a vortex state. And then we go from a vortex state and we shrink the grain size until we um, come back to a uniform state. So we have essentially a sort of grain size hysteresis loop, which looks something like this. So we're increasing the grain volume here. We then suddenly collapse to a vortex state. We then decrease the grain volume, the grain size. We remain in the vortex state. And then we come back up to um, the um, uniform magnetized. And essentially the um, largest um, the single domain state, in this case here for a TM25 grain, persists uh, up to about 250 um, nanometers. 
And when we decrease the grain volume, the single vortex state persists down to about 80 nanometers. So anything below 80 nanometers will always be in a, a uniform magnetized state. It will essentially be in a single domain state. And anything above 250 will always be within a vortex state, a single vortex. But anything between 80 and uh, 250 can be either a single vortex or single domain, depending upon uh, its prehistory. So what we've done is we've modeled this um, for um, uh, equidimensional cube octahedrons. And we've done this for a range of um, uh, titanomagnetite compositions. And so what we see here is our SP region in blue, our SD region shown here in green, the transition zone between the single domain and single vortex in yellow, and then where we, where we have orange, this is just the pure single vortex um, state. And so one of the things that we can sort of see quite, quite um, prominently is actually that the pure single domain state uh, region is actually quite small. For a magnetite, it's only about 55 to 70 nanometers. It's at its widest for um, about TM40, which is about 55 to 105 uh, nanometers. But what's really quite interesting, and quite important, is actually this transition zone, this SD to single vortex transition region is highly variable. For magnetite, it's, it's very small. Um, it's on the order of about 70 to 93 nanometers. And for TM40, it's at its largest, and that's like 100 and about 100 to about 360 uh, nanometers. So we're looking at over a 200 nanometer range um, that where we have this uh, domain state duality. And what's kind of interesting about this uh, transition zone is that if we look at some of the work from Les Nagy, where he's looking at the uh, relaxation times of these magnetic particles, what he's found is that for magnetite, um, in uh, the size range of about 85 to 95 nanometers. This is a, an unstable zone, so it has very short relaxation times on the order of, of a year or less. So this is a size range that is paleomagnetically uh, unstable. And this actually coincides very nicely or very closely to um, the single domain, single vortex tra uh, transition zone that we see here. So Les gets a value of about 85 to 95, our transition zone for magnetite is 70 to about 95. So it matches this uh, upper region. Now, one of the uh, key things, key observations that Les noted um, was that these, um, um, these particles with very short relaxation times had what's called hard aligned vortices. So this is an example from the TM25 grain. This is um, cubic anisotropy with a 111 easy axis. So these triangular surfaces represent the easy axis and the square surfaces represent the hard axis. And we can see that we have quite a large grain size range of about 80 to 180 nanometers where the vortex aligns along the hard axis. So this is what we mean when we talk about a hard aligned um, uh, vortex. And this actually makes up about 70% of uh, the transition zone. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to sort of map this out, uh, this hard aligned region um, for the TM compositions. And what we can see is that we have, again, quite a large area of our um, single domain, single vortex uh, transition zone um, corresponds to domain states, which are single vortices aligned along uh, a magnetic hard axis. And so this actually suggests that um, if this matches, if the relationship that we see here matches the um, uh, short relaxation times that, that Les Nagy observed, this actually implies that intermediate titanomagnetite compositions may have a very large or a relatively large a grain size range where um, they are essentially poor magnetic recorders. They are not capable of preserving uh, stable signals for uh, sufficiently long periods of time to be useful for anything that we would like to use them for. And but one of the caveats here is that we, we still haven't uh, been able to uh, actually dig into the uh, calculations uh, that we need to do to determine what the relaxation times are uh, as a function of, of grain size and composition for uh, the type of magnetite series. Um, and so what we were able, what we have been able to do is to look at how um, the um, transition zone changes not only as a function of the composition but also as a function of the grain shape, essentially the grain uh, elongation. So what we're showing here is um, we have our titano magnetite composition along this axis here, our aspect ratio, our elongation along this axis here. So 
0.5 corresponds to a grain that is two times longer than it is wide. And this bottom surface here corresponds to the um, single domain um, uh, threshold here. So anything below this bottom surface is a uh, uniformly magnetized state. And anything above this upper surface is a pure uh, vortex state. So everything that's sandwiched in between these two uh, layers represents the transition zone. And sort of one of the things that we can see is that um, with elongation, uh, this transition zone actually broadens. So we can see, if we look at TM60, uh, the transition zone starts around uh, here and then it increases up to about um, 360 or so uh, nanometers. So it kind of broadens and widens out with uh, elongation. If we take a few slices of this, this becomes uh, a little bit clearer. So here we're looking at um, three different aspect ratios and how the uh, transition zone changes with uh, composition. So we can see that for um, uh, equidimensional grains, um, we kind of have this sort of bulge here around intermediate compositions. As we go to a slight elongation, so an aspect ratio of 0.75, the transition zone pinches just a little bit. But as we go to even um, uh, higher aspect or even shorter aspect ratios, so higher elongations, we actually find that the transition zone uh, broadens out further. So this is kind of implying that the uh, unstable zone, um, the zone of, of <clears throat> magnetic particles that are, aren't capable of retaining uh, magnetic records for long periods of time, might actually increase with um, the uh, aspect ratio. So as we get longer and longer grains, we might actually be getting some uh, more instabilities uh, in these grains. If we take a slice in the opposite direction, so we're now we're looking at three um, uh, type of magnetite compositions and looking at how uh, the transition zone varies with um, aspect ratio. What we see is that, um, again, we kind of get this growth uh, of the transition zone, so it widens for the uh, TM comp TM30 composition compared to TM0. Um, it broadens a little bit, or shrinks a little bit, sorry, with the TM60 compared to the TM30. But in all cases, what we see uh, again is the fact that for equidimensional grains, the range of the transition zone is narrower than it is for, for more elongate grains. So we, we kind of have this indication that, that, that um, we have quite a large transition zones within um, the Titanomagnetite uh, series, and they may actually give us some unstable uh, paleomagnetic recorders. But it's also important to think about how strong a signal um, these, these minerals, these grains will actually have, and how much they will actually contribute to the uh, magnetic measurements that we're doing. And so this surface here um, it represents the saturation isothermal uh, magnetization, the SIRM, of equidimensional cuboctahedrons. So we're looking at how the uh, magnetic moment varies with um, composition and with uh, grain size. And what we do is essentially we apply the field in, in 50 different directions and we look at the average of these 50 directions so that we get a, a, an average assemblage. And one of the interesting things that we see is that the strongest uh, moment comes for a TM35 grain that's about 300 uh, nanometers in size. And this is, is, this is the strongest moment across um, the size range and composition range that, that we've looked at. But if we superimpose our um, domain state boundaries onto this, we see that this um, strongest magnetization occurs, the strongest moment occurs within the single domain, single vortex transition. So this is kind of uh, a little bit of a, 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 maybe a red flag because essentially what it's saying is that some of the strongest, uh, magnet, some of the strongest magnetizations that are carried by technomagnetites may actually be carried by um, uh, minerals, by grains, which are unstable recorders. So it, though it might be very strong um, in some of our laboratory measurements that we do, especially the rock magnetic measurements, it may not necessarily be giving us a stable uh, paleomagnetic signal. And so this is something that we need to dig into uh, in a lot more depth and detail. Um, we can break this uh, down a little bit um, in terms of um, how the moments change with a composition, essentially taking some slices um, through um, that surface that we just looked at. So here we have um, um, a 50 nanometer grain on the left-hand side here. And as we increase the um, 
uh, titanium composition. This black line represents the change in the moment. And this change in the moment here is, is fairly linear. And this essentially corresponds to the change in the uh, saturation magnetization. So all of these grains are uniform and uniformly magnetized because they're sufficiently small. Not all of them are stable carriers. Uh, we have um, TM10 to about TM40 are in the single domain range, but uh, anything above this or below this is actually uh, super paramagnetic. When we look at a uh, um, 100 nanometer grain, uh, what we find is that we see much more dramatic changes in the magnetization with composition. So we start with um, uh, magnetite, so we have a relatively low magnetization. It goes up to about um, three to four times the magnetization for a, a TM10 composition. And then it starts to uh, drop off again as we increase the TM60. And this is a combination of uh, compositional dependence and domain state dependence. So the color coding in the background shows us the, the domain state. And so we see that um, in magnetite, we're in a vortex range. As we go to about TM7, TM8, we actually go into the transition zone and we have uh, contributions from both um, vortex and single domain uh, magnetizations. And as we progressively increase the composition, we move out of the transition zone back to uniformly magnetized uh, grains. Now, one, one key point to, to note here is that these are SRM uh, moments. Um, so these are essentially magnetizations that arise after we start from a saturation magnetization. So essentially there are magnetizations that follow this um, uh, grain size hysteresis curve, essentially lying on the green curve here. So we start from a saturated state uh, for most of the grain size range, we actually stay within a uniformly uh, magnetized state. But if we were to consider looking at um, magnetizations which um, aren't starting from a saturated state, so perhaps um, uh, ARMs or TRMs, what we potentially find is that our, our magnetic moments would tend to follow uh, a curve, um, potentially forming a curve along uh, the vortex state structure. So although we have this very strong magnetization, this is because we have predominance of a uniformly magnetized states. If we were to look at other uh, magnetization, magnetizations, we may find that the remnants is coming out at much lower values. It may be more uniform across the compositional range. This is something that we need to uh, look at in more detail uh, in future work. Now, the last thing I want to, to talk about is stuff that is um, quite literally hot off the machine. Um, some of these uh, figures are only made a little bit earlier today. Um, and some of these models are still actually uh, running on my computer at the moment. And this is the, the magnetic hysteresis. And so what we've been done, what we've done so far is we've looked at um, three compositions. So magnetite, TM30 and TM60. Now to model the hysteresis, um, what we do is we look at uh, an average of 30 field directions. And this is an example up here of a TM of a 145 nanometer TM30 grain and looking at all the 30 uh, field orientations. So essentially we apply uh, the field uh, in 30 directions uniformly around the sphere so that we average over the magnetocrystalline and the, the, the geometry um, uh, angles. And then we average these 30 uh, loops together to give us a single loop for our um, TM30 145 nanometer grain. And um, what we've been looking at, if you've been looking at grain sizes from about 50 up to uh, 300 nanometers, um, we've got about 20, 12 to 26 steps. These are not complete. Um, and some of the largest grain sizes for TM30 and TM60 um, aren't yet complete. So those results are not robust uh, just yet. Um, but we also, um, we don't just model hysteresis, we also model um, the backfield demagnetizations. And we look at, um, the various parameters, uh, saturation magnetization, uh, remnants, coercivities, and so on. So this is um, a plot showing our saturation remnants, MRS, um, uh, for magnetite as a function of the grain size. And what we see here is we have um, this increase in the remnants moment, which is related to the uh, volumetric increase um, for uniformly magnetized grains. The um, transition zone for magnetite um, occurs around about um, 80 to 90 nanometers. So we see a small drop in the remnants um, around this uh, range here. 
But then as we move through the transition zone into the uh, single vortex uh, zone, we see this um, fairly linear increase in the remnant magnetization uh, with grain size. And this is related to the uh, volumetric increase, uh, not of just of the grain, but of the size of the vortex core. And if we look at um, the transitions, the changes with um, Titano Magnetite 30 and TM60, what we see is we see this very strong volumetric increase. So TM30 is shown in, in orange here. We see this very strong um, volumetric increase up to about um, 170 uh, nanometers or so. Um, but we don't actually see a clear sign of the transition zone. So for TM30, our transition, transition zone is actually very large. It's somewhere on the order of about 100 to 200 nanometers. So we see predominantly a uniformly magnetized grains. So in the remnant state, they're uniformly magnetized. And so we don't really see any sign of the transition zone uh, within um, the, the remnants values. And the same is true for uh, TM60. These sort of sharp drops off that we see here, these represent where we've moved to the, um, from uniformly magnetized to a vortex state. Um, but these last couple of points are, are maybe not so um, robust. Um, if we normalize the magnetization, sorry? Uh, just a minute or two left. Yeah. So if we normalize the magnetization, we don't really see very much uh, either. So we don't really see any sign of the transition zone in the TM30 or the TM60 grains. The transition zone for magnetite is this, this cluster of points here, this drop off as we go from the single domain uh, to the vortex state. So this kind of implies that the transition zone um, for uh, the remnants or the, the, the squareness ratio is potentially somewhere in this very sharp drop here. But this is only about a 50 nanometer uh, size range. But we need to go into to more detail into the finer resolution of our grain sizes. If we look at uh, coercivity, however, um, again, this is a magnetite. What we find is that, that the coercivity in magnetite shows a very strong drop in, um, in correlation to the transition zone. So we go from about um, 11 or 12 millitesla down to about um, two or three millitesla. We then have this big spike up as we go into to the vortex state. And then the gradual decrease um, with increasing grain size. And if we look at the um, TM30 and the TM60s, we do start to see some indication of the transition zone here. So for TM30 at around 145 nanometers, we get this drop in the coercivity. And then we start to get a, a slight pickup towards 200 nanometers, where we then move into the single vortex range. So although we don't really see much in the way of changes in remnants, uh, coercivity uh, drops uh, in the transition zone for magnetite and TM30. It's not so clear for um, uh, TM60, uh, where the transition zone should be somewhere around 175 to about 200 or so uh, nanometers. But the coercivity of TM60 is, is very low because of its low uh, mediated crystalline anisotropy. Um, we can look again also at the, the uh, coercivity of remnants. And again, we can see this uh, drop in BCR uh, that corresponds to uh, the transition zone. But if we normalize out uh, the coercivity, so we normalize BC, uh, BC over BCR, essentially the transition zone essentially disappears. Uh, we have fairly flat lines, so they're fairly consistent um, from the uniformly magnetized state into the transition zone. And the only change that we really see is when we move to grain sizes that are uh, well into the uh, single vortex state. So the transition zone doesn't really manifest in this BC over BCR. And if we um, put all of this together in terms of, of a day plot, we don't really see anything super outstanding in terms of um, the transition zones where we're looking at, at single domain, uh, at coexistence of single domain and single vortex. For magnetite shown in, in blue, we do see a little bit of a trend here. So we have our cluster of, of um, uh, single domain grains up in the cubic anisotropy region, so squareness of 0.86. We drop down on a slope here. And then we have a break in the slope that corresponds to the change in the um, uh, vortex state. But we do see this step out um, for the TM30 where um, the TM30 pops a little bit to the top, um, uh, right top right of the, of the day plot. And that 
kind of matches a little bit what's seen in some of the early data from uh, Day et al. Um, but this is something that needs to be looked at in more detail because the grain sizes that they were looking at originally um, uh, are much, much larger than what we're looking at. But overall, we need to, to uh, do a lot more uh, modeling of the hysteresis to get a systematic change in the properties. So after that sort of whirlwind uh, roundup of, of, of Titan magnetite properties, I guess one of the key questions that we're all kind of interested in is, is what is the Titan of the magnetites? And I think the kind of takeaway message from all of this is that really Titan and magnetites are not all equal. You know, the, the transition zone between single domain and single vortex um, changes as a function of composition uh, and, and grain morphology. And it's much larger for these intermediate um, uh, titanium compositions. And that might indicate that they are uh, much less stable uh, magnetic carriers. Um, this, this also comes with a caveat that these unstable carriers might actually uh, contribute quite substantially to uh, some magnetic remnancies, in particular uh, SIRM, um, but they may not be so substantial if we look at other uh, low field remnancies, and that's something that needs to be uh, looked at in detail. But a sort of flip side of this is that um, more work from, from Les Nagy has actually shown that, that titanomagnetite or, or um, magnetite can actually have stable single vortex states occurring up to about one micron in size. And essentially, this, this gives us hope, and we need to look at this again in more detail, that actually some of the intermediate titanomagnetites may actually be stable single vortex states to not just one micron, but perhaps several microns. And so some of the grains that we um, often dismiss um, as being unstable multi-domain carriers, provided they have the right composition, they may actually um, give us stable paleomagnetic uh, recorders. And we need to go uh, into a lot more detail looking at the, the hysteresis behavior and understanding the relationship between the hysteresis properties and the thermal stabilities, because we really need to try and understand and address whether or not this um, unstable zone is actually present in all uh, titanomagnetites. And once we can kind of start to answer these questions, once we can pin down um, the, the outstanding question of really whether or not these vortex states are truly stable across uh, the entire uh, titanomagnetite series, we can then start to dig into some of the more complicated behavior uh, that we typically see in titanomagnetites where we have very unusual morphologies or even complex uh, oxyac solution patterns, which uh, their impact on the remnants, we still do not know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That's the uh, last talk of the day. When uh, you have a question? Well, it was a bit cheeky of me to ask a question, really. But you should, um, you should know all these answers already, Lynn. You're an author. <laughs> You're an author. <laughs> I to highlight a, a few things that, um, that, that, you, that maybe you didn't um, talk about, or I didn't have enough time to talk about. But you know, this unstable zone has been uh, been a real um, enigma, really. But one of the things that uh, that you've shown there, but, but you didn't dwell on, was the the variation in um, blocking temperatures as a function of grain size and the variation of, of uh, coercivities as a function of grain size. So the first thing to mention is that, that uh, this, this unstable zone could be a really trivial thing, right? It's just like a superpower magnetic region, except we don't know what happens at the boundaries. But then, uh, but then the unstable zone, uh, you know, if you look at equidimensional magnetite, it's, it's a very small region, but it, it's not that much uh, smaller than the whole single domain range. If you talk for single domain range going from what, about 40 to 80 or 90 nanometers in magnetite, and then this unstable zone is about 20 or 30 nanometers in grain size range. And for titan magnetite, you've shown, and for eulogenic grains, you imply it could be a lot larger. But then you have this very strange behavior on the vortex side of that of that unstable zone, where the blocking temperatures continue to increase incredibly rapidly, much more stable than single domain even. But conversely, the coercivities decrease. Right. So when you're doing AF demagnetization of your sample, your most stable AF um, grains may, may not be anywhere near your most stable blocking temperatures. So all sorts of weird things going on. I don't know what the answers are, Greg, but my, my brain cells are rapidly uh, decaying. I'm hoping you've figured it all out before 
Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a, an entire question in there, uh, but, no, but I, mean, I think it, it, I think it, I think this really highlights um, that there is um, quite a lot that we don't know, um, and that um, you know we've kind of built a lot of, of our understanding around uh, Niall theory and, and single domain theory, and that that has served us well for a, a, a reasonable amount of time. But um, you know, we have. You know, there's a, a realization that the vast majority of our recorders are not uniformly magnetized grains. They're in much more complicated um, domain structures, and they're not necessarily all pure magnetite. Um, this titanomagnetite series is is quite a substantial contributor to um, to magnetic remnancies, and so kind of understanding and unraveling. Uh, what some of this stuff means in terms of a, of a, of a paleomagnetic context is something that that um, you know really needs to 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 need, needs to be done. Yeah, no, it's great talk, and I guess I was rambling on because I you know there's a great community here, lots of paleomankers, and all these little buggers are in the samples that they're measuring, mm. and I'm not sure what's going on in them. And so it, it'd be you know it, it, it it's nice to to make people aware of the sorts of things that could be going on. Anyway, great talk. Thanks, Greg. Cheers. Uh, Brendan, you have a question? Yeah, I thought this talk was really interesting. I, I just wanted to ask, um, so what is it in your models that you're using to define these boundaries between SD and the intermediate zone and the vortex? Maybe I didn't catch that. Um, yeah, so it's essentially what we're doing here is, is kind of a little bit of a grain size, we call it double grain size hysteresis essentially. So what we do is we start with um, uh, a particular grain volume or grain size and we give it a, a uniform magnetization and then we um, find the minimum energy solution and characterize the uh, domain state of that solution. We then kind of increase the grain size and, and essentially repeat that process. And we repeat that process until we see um, this transition, which is essentially where we start from a uniform magnetized state, but the most stable state, um, the minimum energy state is a vortex state. And that kind of tells us the largest grain size that um, a single domain state is energetically favorable at. And then essentially we do the opposite um, by starting at a, a single vortex state. And we look at, at the point at which a single vortex state, uh, an initial single vortex state will collapse into uh, a uniformly magnetized state. And that tells us the lowest grain volume that um, uh, a vortex state is energetically favorable. And between these two uh, boundaries, this represents the transition where, depending upon whether we start from a saturated magnetization or whether we start from some randomized state or a vortex state, we could go into either uh, a grain could either be vortex or uh, uniformly magnetized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so here it would be <coughs> right. It'd be between something like eighty and two fifty nanometers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's eight, eighty to two fifty for this uh, particular grain. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thanks. Cheers. Lisa is wondering uh, in the chat, uh, how do we detect these in our samples and how do we neutralize them for say paleo intensity experiments? Um, that's, that's a good question. And this is, I mean, this kind of goes back a little bit perhaps to um, some of Wynn's comments where we see that, you know, with increasing vortex or with increasing grain size, you know, we see an increase in the blocking temperature, but a decrease in the coercivity. And so that might actually suggest um, that, that, that switching between, really certainly for, you know, switching between either thermal and AFD magnetization might allow us to do some preferential cleaning, but it's not, it's pro it's not gonna be quite that simple. Um, and I think this is something that, that, that needs to be kind of delved into into more detail. And if the I mean, and if the the drop in the coercivities for the sort of unstable zone is is consistent, um, this kind of AF cleaning might work. I'm not sure if the drop is going to be large enough that it will be practical. I just did a whole set of experiments doing AF and then thermal and and 
on basically what I call AF Izzy, mm. and it's horrible. It's much worse. Than <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this is where we need to start to to get more systematic sort of modeling on these and looking at how, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very close to this, the point where we can actually simulate a full set of paleomagnetic experiments with with, with Merrill. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we need to go, I think. Mm -hmm. Andre? Greg, thank you for that Hi. very thought-provoking talk, but I was a little bit surprised you didn't mention how do you define your SDSP boundary. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we kind of glossed over that a little bit. Um, so what we actually do is um, we take, um, um, you know, so we take a, 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 a a grain and we magnetize it along uh, an easy axis, so say one, one, one. And then we calculate the energy barrier using this nudged elastic band method um, as we go from uh, one, one, one to say uh, minus one, one, one. And essentially the, this, this nudged elastic band method is a way of, of uh, determining yeah, yeah. the uh, energy barriers uh, between uh, the transitions. That. Okay. And that's yeah. essentially what, what we yeah, do. But Greg, then I really don't understand why why does your S, uh, SPSD limit for magnetite uh, very much at odds with experimental data? Because you, you know you surely know that mm. famous David Dunlop's 39, 37 nanometers sample, which is really at least half of its volume is 37 and below, and it has a remnant at room temperature. It's not SP. And so this, if so you this look is, at this the, is, yeah. so this is um, if you look at the data for synthetic magnetites, it's all it, they all point to something like 30 nanometers rather than 50. Yeah. So yeah. So this is um, this is kind of interesting. Is that um, you know, so th there's there's some difference when I mean, we've tried to compare the Merrill outputs to to experimental data, especially exactly, powder yeah. data. There and, is well, there, let's not not just powder data, but other stuff. Um, there is a bit of a, a difference. Uh, surprisingly, of, the all the all the all the micromagnetic models did did better job to my if I recall well, yeah, about about this SPSD limit. It wasn't yes. that? So, I mean, one of the one of the things that we see is so that there is something that is when, uh, yeah. not taken into account in this model. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I suspect that it's likely to be um, interactions. So, you know, yeah. one of the things, one of the things, but so, but what, so you model for single grains, yeah. Yeah, so these models are, are just single uh, yeah, grains. You don't have any great. form of interactions. Okay. And there, there okay. have, there have been studies on, on SP particles where um, essentially, they have interacting clusters of, of SP particles that have um, uh, are, have remnants, and so yeah. this is this is a bit of a, a frontier in nanotechnology to develop um, uh, essentially uh, magnetic memory yeah, devices, yeah. and so it is entirely possible to, to see a remnant still. of an interacting SP particle. Yeah, but that much remains okay and yeah. one if i can one more brief yeah. remark but maybe okay you start with very very basic physics uh, uh, i think th that you want to deliver to us paleomagnetist but f from the point of view of physics it would be much it, uh, the figures uh, like uh, properties versus composition would sound very much better if you do the if you do the modeling at the same reduced temperature rather than at room temperature right because uh, if if the model is done for room temperature you cannot uh, separate effect of uh, the uh, that okay magnetite is at one third of its reduced temperature at room te at room yeah. if you um, pressure that's, of that's, that's point true. and tm60 is at two thirds yeah. Um, but from a, from a paleomagnetic perspective, we do most of yeah, our work in exactly, measurements of room yeah, temperature, which is, is a little bit more. This relevant. is just a villain, <laughs> Some, uh, <laughs> something that the community would be willing from you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you again uh, for that great talk. Yeah.
and we'll we'll stay in touch with the uh, ma magic uh, magnet seminars. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All Cheers. right. Well, thank you, Greg.